Greetings, everyone. It is I, Jared Taylor, from the Biology 112 teaching team here at UBC. In this video, I would like to introduce you to the amino acids, the monomer building blocks that cells use to make proteins. So here is a different type of question that I'm sure all of you have been asking. When? When do we finally get to talk about proteins? Okay, fair enough. That is probably less you and more the instructors that are asking that. You see, we love talking about proteins because proteins are a big deal in biology and biochemistry. When a cell needs to do something, the answer is almost always a protein. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. To talk about proteins, we first need to talk about amino acids. And given the complex relationship that amino acids have with proteins, they deserve their own video. The general structure of an amino acid is shown here using a partial skeletal structure for simplicity. Each amino acid has an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. It is these groups that the cells use to link the amino acids together in a chain. The carboxylic carbon on one amino acid is covalently linked to the nitrogen on the next, creating what is known as a peptide bond. The growing chain of amino acids is referred to as a polypeptide chain due to the series of peptide bonds employed. In nature, these chains can range in size from only a few amino acids to over 30,000 amino acids in length. However, the average chain length inside cells is about 300 amino acids. Anyway, back to the amino acids themselves. The interesting and important part of each amino acid is its R group. For amino acids, the R group corresponds to what is called the side chain, and it is here that the various amino acid monomers differ from each other. The different side chains have different physical and chemical properties, and there are many ways to classify them. For us here in Biology 112, we will classify them into three broad categories. Hydrophobic, hydrophilic non-charged, and hydrophilic charged. Let me talk about each category in turn. The hydrophobic side chains almost entirely comprise carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. In other words, these side chains of which there are nine, are almost entirely nonpolar. This means that these side chains are great at making induced dipole-based interactions. There are some interesting things to point out here. Methionine's side chain contains a sulfur atom and therefore does have some weak polarity. However, in most cases, this side chain acts like a typical nonpolar group. Tryptophan has two large carbon-based rings that are very nonpolar. The only weird part is that one of the rings does contain a nitrogen with a hydrogen atom that can be donated to form a hydrogen bond. Finally, proline's side chain is quite unusual. Here the side chain loops back onto the amino acid and forms a covalent bond to the amino group. This has some serious implications for proline inside proteins, but that is not something we deal with here in Biology 112. You can simply treat proline as another hydrophobic amino acid. Next up, we have the six hydrophilic non-charged amino acids. These side chains contain some significant polar bonds and therefore are really good at making permanent dipole-based interactions, especially hydrogen bonds. There is a couple of things to mention here. First, cysteine's thiol group, the sulfur and the hydrogen, are only weakly polar. Therefore, this side chain only makes weak permanent dipole interactions, including hydrogen bonds. Second, tyrosine does have a large carbon-hydrogen ring that can make induced dipole-based interactions quite easily. However, the alcohol group of the side chain is very polar and is great at making permanent dipole interactions, including hydrogen bonds. This is often what we are interested in when dealing with tyrosine. Finally, we come to the five hydrophilic charged amino acids. As the name suggests, these side chains almost always carry a full ionic charge. As you can probably guess, they are amazing at forming ionic-based interactions. By now, you will have noticed that I keep mentioning the types of non-covalent interactions that these amino acids can make. In Biology 112, much of what we will discuss when talking about proteins is the type of non-covalent interactions that are occurring inside any given protein. For example, let's imagine we have a serine and an asparagine close together inside a protein. 
The alcohol group of the serine is polar and has a hydrogen atom that can be donated to a hydrogen bond. The asparagine has a polar oxygen with some lone pairs of electrons that can act as a hydrogen bond acceptor, although I haven't shown the electrons here. Thus, these two amino acids can easily form a hydrogen bond inside a protein. On the other hand, what if we had a leucine and an asparagine close together? The leucine side chain is completely nonpolar and can only make induced dipole-based interactions. The asparagine side chain is of course polar due to its polar bonds. Therefore, these two amino acids could use an induced dipole to permanent dipole interaction. You will see more examples of this in Biology 112 when we discuss proteins, which, I might add, is going to be very soon. And that means we will be talking a lot about the 20 amino acids and the type of non-covalent interactions that they can make with each other. For now, I will sign off, and I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the amino acids. In the next video, I will introduce proteins and discuss how non-covalent interactions are important for protein structure.